Thanks very much for coming. Thanks very much for, for having me here. Yeah, so the title of my presentation is uh, to road to uh, quantum computers and as mentioned I'm at the Department of Computing. Uh, however, I want to emphasize that my background is actually in theoretical physics. So I would say I'm really at this interface, um, this interdisciplinary interface um, where we try to use new physics for new information technology. And uh, I would also like to start my presentation uh, with uh, Richard Feynman who was a famous theoretical physicist. He won the, the Nobel Prize in 1965. And I think it's fair to say that he was one of the first who really envisioned the potential of, of quantum technologies. Okay? And as we already heard, the point is if you, if you start to look at smaller and smaller systems, so in particular at single atoms uh, or electrons, then <coughs> it becomes hard to predict how these systems behave or the physical law uh, change. Okay? And uh, so let me quote uh, Feynman here on something he said in, in 1981 on understanding physics with, with quantum computers. Uh, so, let me read it to you. Um, trying to find a computer simulation of physics seems to me to be an excellent problem to follow out. Okay? However, nature is not classical, damn it. And if you want to make a simulation of nature, you would better make it quantum mechanical. And by golly, it's a wonderful problem because it does not look so easy. Okay? And uh, so that was like more than 35 five years ago, right? So let's see of, of what what he actually says here. So basically what he says is we should uh, turn things around. Okay? We should not try to use standard, normal, classical computers to understand what's happening on this very small scale, because this is very hard, but we should actually use the, the complexity or the richness of these small quantum mechanical systems to do information processing. Okay? And this is exactly what, what we're doing or what we're trying to do uh, nowadays, and information processing based on quantum physics on these very small scale systems is what we call uh, nowadays quantum information science. Okay. And uh, yeah, as uh, also already mentioned, if we want to make that happen, of course, the first step is to build hardware, right? To build quantum hardware. And to do this, uh, of course, we need to be able uh, to build very well uh, controlled quantum systems, right? We need to be able to um, handle single uh, atoms and electrons and need uh, to make them do exactly what we want. And there are many uh, different approaches to do that. So. So let me tell you about uh, these few I have here on, uh, on my slide. So that's, for example, uh, cavity quantum electrodynamics, uh, optical lattices, ion traps, superconductors, quantum dots, linear optics, or nuclear magnetic resonance, and so on and so on. So these are maybe a bit like technical terms, but my point that I want to make here is that we have uh, lots of researchers here at Imperial College London uh, that, that work on, on these questions, right? That, that, uh, trying to build well-controlled quantum systems based on, on this technology. And uh, we have this Imperial Center for Quantum Engineering Science and Technology, uh, also called QUEST. Okay. And now, what we can do with this hardware is we can directly use this hardware um, for tailored applications. Okay? So we also, in, in these previous talks, we, we heard a, a few examples of, of how this is done. So, so the examples I have here is our quantum sensing, uh, quantum clocks, uh, quantum annealing, or analog uh, quantum simulations. And the point here really is that this kind of hard, uh, quantum hardware, uh, it can do something that we, uh, it can do something better than the, the classical, the, the standard hard, uh, hardware could do that, that we had before. But here I would uh, again like to go uh, one step further, okay? I would not only like to have specifically tailored hardware, but what we would actually want is to have a full computer, right? A fully programmable quantum computer. And this is in, in, in analogy to, to classic technology, right? You can either have specifically tailored hardware to do specific things, or you can build a computer that you can fully program and tell the computer what to do, right? And the goal on the quantum level is, the long-term goal is of course the same. And if you want to have this computer, then of course you also need software. You need to tell the computer what, what, what it should do, what it should calculate, right? And my work is more on, uh, on, this, on this software side than on the, the hardware questions that we, we heard about before. Okay, um, so let me uh, tell you a little bit about uh, these uh, software questions. So the main motivation is really if we have a quantum computer, okay, we can do things, we can calculate things that otherwise we do not know how to calculate. And with the best of our knowledge, we will also not know how to calculate with any future classical computer, okay? So it's really, that's, that's why we really want it, because we can do something or we can do things that we cannot do otherwise. 
And uh, so let me tell you uh, a bit about the things that we, we would be able to do that we, we cannot do these days. And so for the, the first bullet point here, I would go back, uh, like go back to, to Richard Feynman, right? Um, <coughs> so in particular, <coughs> Uh, we would be able to do quantum simulation, okay? So if you think, for example, about uh, chemical reactions, if you want to predict how like single molecules behave and so on and so on, this is something that's very hard to do on a, on, on a standard classical computer. So it, it, you need very high uh, computing power and you can only um, talk about the, you know, couple of molecules or, or very simple uh, ch chemical uh, reactions, basically. <coughs> and here, <coughs> with quantum computers, we would be able to uh, understand much, much larger, much more complicated systems. And of course, if you think about applications, you can, for example, uh, think of the designs of, of improved catalysts, which will then uh, allow um, you know, more efficient synthesis of, of certain materials that, that you need in large quantities. Okay? So that's kind of the, the, the idea here. But then, again, we can go one step further. So we can not only look at these uh, you know, uh, chemical reactions or specific uh, chemical systems, but we can ask more generally, if we have this quantum computer, if you have this quantum device, what can we compute, right? We don't need to stop at computing these, these physical reactions, but we can just more generally ask, like, what can we compute? And there is lots of, of theoretical work on this topic, and it turns out that there are a certain class of problems that we cannot solve on a standard, normal classical computer, but that we could solve on a, on a quantum uh, computer, okay? So this, this super polynomial speed up basically means we cannot do it on a normal computer, but we could do it on a quantum computer. And the uh, class of problems are, for example, certain linear and convex optimization problems. And if you think about applications there, then uh, these are um, problems that are very relevant in machine learning, for example. Okay? And then the, the second example I have here is, is, is I think, the, the most um, famous example. It's a prime factorization algorithm to, to factor large numbers. So what is that? Um, let me uh, say a few more words about this uh, second example. So if you, if you take any number, any natural number, uh, you can always write it as, as a product of, of prime numbers. Okay? And so in a unique way, actually. So that means <coughs> you're trying to find the prime factorization of any given number. And now the point of this quantum algorithm for prime factorization is that if I give you a very large number, this algorithm can tell you the, the prime factorization of that number. And that's something how we that we don't know how to do on a, on a classical computer. Okay. So this is, was first realized by Peter Shore in, in, in 1994, and here's just a little graphical description of the algorithm. But wh why is this interesting, right? This sounds like an interesting like, number theoretical problem. Um, however, <coughs> it turns out that this very algorithm, it can break the so-called RSA public uh, key crypto system. Okay? So again, what does that mean? Well, that means that a quantum computer can break virtually any encryption scheme that is in use today. And uh, we already heard a little bit uh, about uh, that before. <clears throat> but let me emphasize here that it's really like any encrypted conversation that you're trying to have nowadays is based on this RSA public key um, crypto system. So for example, if you do bank transactions online and so on and so on. And moreover, this also um, applies backwards, okay? So all the data that is encrypted nowadays suddenly becomes in, uh, insecure, right? decrypted, once we have a quantum computer. So this is really, I think this algorithm has really uh, like major, major consequences go, go, going forward. Okay? And this actually brings me to the, to the third uh, bullet point, which is, which is quantum cryptography. And uh, here I would argue that there are two different aspects of quantum cryptography. The first one is what I just talked about, namely <clears throat> we want quantum safe cryptography, right? So we want uh, cryptographic schemes that are also safe if the eavesdropper, the person that is trying to break the scheme, has access to quantum technologies, right? So the current schemes we're using, they, you know, we think they're secure, but they have not been analyzed properly against uh, uh, eavesdroppers that have access to quantum technologies, okay? So that's the, the field of quantum safe cryptography, I would call it. Uh, but then luckily, um, these quantum technologies you know, they're not only available potentially to an eavesdropper, but also to ourselves, right? That we're trying to, to communicate uh, with each other um, in, a, in a secure way. So that means we can use quantum technology to actually have um, unconditionally secure communication, okay? So <clears throat> that is what I would call a quantum-based cryptography. Okay, so if you build cryptographic schemes from, from, from quantum technology, 
you can really make them secure from hacking by, by the, the laws of physics. Okay? This is in very stark contrast to classical technology that are in principle always hackable, it's just that they're designed in a clever way so that, such that you would need a lot of resources to actually hack those systems. Okay? So this quantum-based cryptography, <coughs> of course it goes hand in hand with this quantum uh, safe cryptography, but I just wanted to emphasize these two different uh, points of, of cryptography. <coughs> and that the first bullet point is we can now go further, of course. We can not only think about like two parties communicating in a, like a point-to-point -point fashion, but we can think of, of, of whole networks, yeah, of a whole quantum internet, where all the parties, all the nodes of the network can communicate uh, safely in a, in a physically secure uh, safe way. Okay? And this is basically what I and, and my group uh, are working on. So we're working on the mathematical aspects of quantum cryptography and quantum communication theory. Okay? And this goes all the way from a very mathematical analysis, why, why these uh, algorithms or these schemes work or, or developing new schemes, uh, all the way down to making those schemes more practical and, and trying to, to actually implement them and connect them to, to classical. Okay, so I uh, would basically already uh, like uh, to conclude uh, at this point. And I, uh, what I want, uh, I want to make the point that it's, when it comes to these quantum technologies, I personally strongly think that now is uh, the time to act. And, and that let me uh, give you the, the reason why, why, why I think so. Okay? So first of all, there's a very strong academic interest and a, and a very solid uh, funding situation. Okay? So amongst uh, other schemes, we have the so-called UK National Network of Quantum Technology Hubs, as well as the European Union uh, Quantum uh, Manifesto, flagship scale initiative in quantum technology. Okay? And here we're really uh, talking um, at the scale of, of billions of euros investment. Okay? And then, <clears throat> specifically when it comes to these cryptographic questions, okay, then we also have the various uh, central intelligence uh, agencies like GCHQ or NSA that I think approximately since last year, they're really saying like, we must act now against the quantum computing threat in cryptography, right? <clears throat> and the reason they're saying this is because of course it takes a long time to change all the protocols you use to, to communicate with, okay? So even, we don't have a, a, a fully fledged uh, quantum computer yet, but we need to act now kind of to make sure that in the future we can still have uh, secure communication. Okay, and then <clears throat> lastly here, I think what really um, changed the game a lot, that is maybe in the, in the last two years, uh, many IT companies, um, they, they also started to taking uh, this technology seriously. So they started throwing, throwing big money, okay? So I just have a, a few companies listed here. Uh, Alibaba, Google, IBM, Intel, or Microsoft, but, but many more, okay? And again, here we're talking at the committed investments on, in, on the order of, of billions of US dollars, okay? So it's really, it's, it, it's starting to become a bigger business. There are also many um, small, but small uh, startup companies. Okay, so for my very last sentence, let me just say that I think uh, with our initiative in quantum technologies at Imperial College London, we really have to the excellence to push these uh, technologies uh, to the next level. Thanks for your attention.